Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. Today we're going to talk about how to test Rust, and how this is different to testing in other popular languages. Rust is so reliable, because if used correctly, whole categories of bugs are impossible to express. For the remainder of the bugs that are possible to express, you will indeed need to test. We have a lot of ground to cover today. I won't spend more than a minute on each of these, with great recommendations and tips. As ever, I have exceedingly good news for you. Rust tests are another example of why we accept more syntax in Rust than in other languages. Code is only boilerplate when it doesn't give us anything. Rust's syntax gives us superpowers because the compiler can do so much work for us. Here, we are modeling a browser web event. We have variants for the page loading and unloading, and user interaction. In enums, names and type information together specify the variant. Page load doesn't equal page unload, and key press char doesn't equal paste string. Each of these enumerations is independent and the compiler knows they mean different things. Then in our code, instead of writing spaghetti if statements, we match the current state of the application and execute different behaviors based on this state. No other actions are possible because we're responding to exactly the state we were given. If more nuance is needed, then don't write an if statement, add more detail to your model. This keeps us safe. You might not have noticed that we've not handled all cases of the web event enum. Paste is unhandled. It's easy for a human to miss, even in this little example, but the compiler didn't miss it. If you model your whole application state using enums and structs, it becomes very difficult to make logical errors. The incredibly thorough compiler powered by the extra syntax Rust has compared to other languages allows us to express our intentions in a machine-readable way. I explained this in more detail in my previous video, Rust Makes Sense. So for now, we will move on from language to tooling. When used right, Rust's built-in linter won't just make your code cleaner and more idiomatic, but with the unwrap used warning here, safer and more correct too. The unwrap used warning reminds you that while unwrapping a result is fine for prototyping code, you must not let it creep into production. In fact, I recommend in your CI pipeline you configure this warning to be an error and fail the build. Force you and your team to explain why they are so sure the result is unsafe using the expect method. More details in my previous video about Rust errors. If you run Clippy with the fix option, which can correct your code if it is safe to do so, by default you will see this warning if you're not checked in in version control. The cargo developers really have thought of everything. Let's start with happy path testing. These are minimal sanity checks you might do anyway, poking your code with sensible data and ensuring it does the right thing. Assertions are the bread and butter of code testing. We've used them in every language and they're built into Rust. Note that here I'm using both the assert macro, which always runs, and debug assert, which is bypassed in release builds. Due to the nature of the macro system, it is not even included in the final binary, causing no overhead in production. On to my favorite kind of test, doc tests rule. Combining documentation and testing into one feature, it was my favorite in Python and I'm delighted they're here in Rust. I recommend choosing doc tests for the lightest touch testing before moving on to the heavier strategies we're going to talk about later. In your doc tests, you can test the annotated function, see line three, but also test anything you want to bring into scope, such as the read line code in the second half of this doc test. Note that you can avoid using a main method inside doc tests by using the TurboFish syntax for the okay result as on line eight. There's a few more cool features. Head to the Rust doc website to learn them. It can be useful, especially if you are building a framework or library to build some small working examples of using your code. Examples that terminate after running or can be made to terminate after a pause in the case of UI or server code can be run as part of your CI pipeline to ensure core functionality works as expected. This technique can be a very powerful and fast way to avoid regressions when combined with assertions. Testing our code works how we expect is only one side of the coin, of course. For more confidence in our code, we must also show that it doesn't work how we don't expect, so that bad actors or incorrect usage is handled correctly. This is vital in public-facing and security-focused projects, like today's sponsor, Razor Secure, who are hiring. First, a quiz. What data center travels at 100 miles per hour, reconfigures every IP when it attaches or detaches to other data centers, all without a reliable power source or internet connection, and must never fail? The answer? A train. Razor Secure is a 50-person startup bringing cutting-edge security tech to the rapidly advancing world of rail. They do this through a Rust intrusion detection and monitoring agent running on board, a cloud environment running Kubernetes, Python microservices, and event-based data processing, and a Yocto hardware platform running custom embedded Linux. Their team and customers span Europe and North America, so if you have taken a train journey here, then Razor Secure's security systems may have already kept you safe. If you are a Python full-stack developer and are excited by this challenge and tech, then they are very interested in speaking to you as they are hiring now. 
The company is fully remote, so wherever you are based, they offer challenging work in an interesting field with some awesome technology. Find out more about jobs at Razorsecure at razorsecure.com forward slash careers. And if you want to apply, use the link razorsecure.noboilerplate.org so they know I sent you. My thanks to Razorsecure for their support of this channel. You might be able to stop after testing just the happy path. Not every project needs comprehensive testing, especially if you are just building on top of well-understood fundamentals. A brochure website, for instance, if built in Rust, doesn't need to be tested through counterexample. The compiler has already told you that every page has valid HTML, no missing closing tags, no SQL injection or memory bugs, and if using a Rust front-end framework like you, the messages passed between your components are type-checked and can't be misused as easily as in other languages' string-based frameworks. However, if you've got a complex database and you're building a big web app, you will want to test comprehensively. Unit tests can be divided neatly in two, those that have no knowledge of library internals and those that do. Public interface testing and private unit testing. Black box tests in Rust typically import a crate and use the same public API that end users or other modules of your app use. Code examples use this method. White box tests are defined in the same module as the code under test, We've already seen doc tests use this method. While black box tests reside simply inside the test folder, white box tests can be defined alongside your code in a submodule in the same file. Conditional compilation, the CFG test line here, means the whole module is stripped out of your release executable, only running in your debug test builds. Here we have a public function, a private user struct, and then a submodule called test that contains our test code. Though you are required to re-import any code you are testing into your test module, Unlike in black box testing, the functions and structs do not need to be labeled public. Both this public function and private struct work fine. Probabilistic testing is a great way to shine a light into the dusty corners of our app that we may have forgotten about. However, in other languages, it often requires boilerplate code. If we want to generate random test input for this hello function in Python, we still have work to do. This is because we don't know what kind of data the input of the function is. The name parameter could be anything. You and I might reasonably guess it's a string, but it could equally be an object, list, or even an integer. In Python, more work is needed. With Rust, we know exactly what to do, and more importantly, the compiler knows exactly what to do. The name param is a string, which in Rust means a valid UTF-8 string, and not only that, we also notate the return value. This is something we would have had to infer or annotate in the Python example. Here, we have more syntax, but it's not boilerplate, and we can now use it to give us superpowers. This is PropTest, a property testing framework inspired by the Hypothesis framework for Python, which was in turn inspired by QuickCheck for Haskell. It allows us to test that certain properties of our code hold for randomized inputs, and if a failure is found, it automatically finds the minimal test case to reproduce the problem. Note that PropTest is taking advantage of two features of Rust that are not available in other popular languages, the rich algebraic type system and macros. PropTest and Python's Hypothesis are extremely similar in operation. But PropTest requires no wrapping of the test function at runtime, due to Rust's type system already encoding that data. In the Python example, the hypothesis framework must be told what kind of data name contains, text, for it to be generated. In order to do this probabilistic testing, Hypothesis had to overlay its own proprietary type system on top of Python. Note that even this simple example is kind of wrong, in Python's case. Name is supposedly text, but it could be any type at runtime. Python makes no guarantees we might not be testing the right thing. In Python, more work is needed. The test assumes that name will quack like a string when it is used. Rust, however, guarantees it. The most comprehensive, though heavyweight tool for this kind of randomized testing in Rust is Cargo Fuzz. Cargo Fuzz uses LLVM's libfuzzer runtime library to generate pseudo-random data and keep track of what has been tested. This means that, unlike with PropTest, you can stop the test and resume it later, and it won't retest the same randomized input twice. This is important in fuzz testing very large systems, as the state space could be effectively infinite, the testing will never complete. Resuming it later, perhaps on a powerful server, is very handy. While it deserves its own video, I will briefly mention integration testing here, because there's some magic still to be found. You may recognize my favorite SQL framework for Rust here, SQL X. Both better than an ORM and a DSL, SQLX runs all your queries against your actual dev database during Rust compilation inside a rolled back transaction. Parameterized data, like the string organization here, because its type is known at compile time, can have random valid data inserted into the query. This is all very wonderful and magic. However, you have just coupled your application's compilation to an external service, the database, and therefore have complicated your building and testing infrastructure. Or 
have you? SQLX has an offline schema feature, which is a great example of doubling, or mocking, or stubbing. You will have heard many names for this technique, but Martin Fowler calls it a double, so that is good enough for me. To double your SQLX database validation and decouple it from a real database, you do two things. Enable the SQLX cargo feature offline, then save query metadata for offline usage using cargo SQLX prepare. And now, any cargo build will use the schema double saved to sqlxdata.json for compile time verification. For your interest, this schema double looks like this. It's simply a description of your database's schema and all features in machine-readable JSON. You check this in when you modify the database, probably when creating a migration, and then your CI pipelines can compile check the project SQL without a SQL database. It's also much faster. I'm writing a follow-up video expanding on integration, doubling, and contract testing, but for now, I'd point you at Pact, which has a comprehensive request contract tooling for microservices in Rust. You will know how far down this list you need to go for your project and your team. Integration and end-to-end -end testing will be next, in a future video. Rust and the community is extremely focused on correctness, and that shines through in the testing ecosystem. If you'd like to support my channel and get early ad-free and tracking-free videos and VIP Discord access, head to patreon.com forward slash no boilerplate. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, please check out my sci-fi podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, click the bottom video to listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile-checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.